Good morning, Rise City Church, Pastor Luke here, and we are gathering on our YouTube channel this morning. Yes, because today is a corporate day of rest for us at Rise City Church. And uh, it is important, it is an important reminder to know that, that we should take moments and opportunities to rest. Now, I don't want us to get it twisted. Today is not a day to be like, you know, uh, just letting ourselves go. The rest, sometimes we can get confused with, with irresponsibility and letting ourselves go. That, that is not today. Today is not the day where we're like breaking out all the junk food and we're like treating our bodies bad and, and you know, we're, we're, we don't know what to do with our time, so we're making poor decisions. No, today is a day of rest. And, and we get that word rest from a word, and you know what that word is? It's restoration. Yes, restoration. And so let today be a day of restoration. How are you restoring your body? How are you restoring your energy? And more than that, how are you allowing the spirit of the living God to give you the rest that you need so that you can continue on in your life in a manner that glorifies and worships him? You know, last week we talked about how uh, following Jesus takes sacrifice. As a matter of fact, in Mark uh, chapter 8, we talked about how Jesus said, in order to be his follower, that you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. That's a difficult thing to do. That's a difficult thing to think about and to do day in and day out. And Jesus knew that. And therefore, he was pretty serious about making sure his disciples rested, but not just for the sake of resting, but for the sake of being restored. So this morning, I pray that you would just give yourself permission to be restored. And how do we, how are we restored? Well, we're restored by the Spirit through, through prayer, gratitude, worship, quiet solitude. We're restored through the practices of fasting. Um, we're restored through the practices of quality time with Jesus. And so today, you're not around a bunch of people. Uh, if you're not allowing a bunch of things to get in the way, and, and this hasn't been an excuse for you to just like get the honey-do list done or, or to wipe out that to-do list, I pray that you would take advantage of today to just rest and be but be and rest with intentionality. Open the word. Seek Jesus at his word. Take some time to pray. Glorify Jesus. Take some time to write down the, the ways that he's blessed you, the way that he has taken care of you, what he's been doing in your life. Just take some time to reflect on that and to allow yourself to be restored in him. Before we enter into the word, and, and I don't have a whole sermon today because I want to make sure that I'm practicing what I'm preaching, right? I don't, I don't want to wear myself out um, preaching this morning, but I do want to encourage you. But before we get into the word, we're going to continue in Mark, but before we get into the word, I want to give you just the opportunity to just make sure that you have your Bible, make sure you're in a space where you're not distracted, the TV's not on unless you're watching this uh, video through it. You know, your cell phones may be put on silent or do not disturb. Just make sure that you are in a space where you are, your attention is undivided. You're not going to become distracted. Uh, you're, you're not going to be um, pulled away and pulled apart through distraction. No preoccupation. Just take this time right now to say, Lord, I give this time to you. This morning, as I take the opportunity to rest, I pray that I would find myself resting in you. Lord, I pray that I wouldn't binge on all the things that, that are not restorative. I wouldn't binge on the Netflix. I'm not going to binge on junk food. I'm not going to binge on you know things that aren't good for my body or for my soul or my eyes. I'm not going to binge on those things. But Lord, I'm going to be present with you. And I'm just going to eat of the bread of life today. And I'm going to be with you. I, I, I want to take a walk with you today. I want to rest with you today. I want to be in your word today. I want to, I want to take some time and be reflective today and rest in you. I want to bring all my burdens to you and lay them at your feet today. So Lord, let this day be a restful day, 
a restorative day in Christ Jesus. And all those that agree with this prayer, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So here is uh, the word that we're going to be in today, this morning. Have my Bible with me. I hope you do too. And the word that we are going to be in is found in Mark chapter 9, verse 2 through 13. And in this time that we find Jesus with his disciples, remember, he just, re well, we just came out of this time where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah and the Christ. And we have this super high, like, yes, Peter, you got it. Your eyes have been opened. But then all of a sudden, Peter just decides he's going to be the one to teach the teacher and what the Messiah must do. And he starts telling Jesus all sorts of things when Jesus tells Peter, hey, I got to suffer. I'm going to be killed. These are This is what's going to happen to me. And Peter's like, no, may it never be. Like, this, this can't happen. This isn't what... This isn't what we've been praying for. This isn't what we've been hoping for. We want you to take the throne. We want you to be here with us forever. We want you to restore the kingdom of Israel now and the nation now. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are not concerned with the matters of God, but with the matters of men, right? So we have this rebuke onto uh, Peter who is rebuking Jesus. Okay, so then Jesus goes on to say with the crowd, he, he, he invites the crowd aside with his disciples and he says, listen, the son of man must suffer. He must suffer. And if any of you want to follow me, you have to follow me into my suffering. You have to follow me by uh, denying yourself. That means separating yourself from yourself. You, you have to be separated from yourself, your self-centeredness, your self-righteousness, your, your self-absorption, uh, all this uh, things that where the world needs to revolve around you, where you need to separate from your sinfulness. You need to separate from your pride and your hostility and your arrogance and your greed and all these things that are just so um counter to the heart of God. You need to separate yourself from those things. And you need to pick up your cross. That means that you need to leave yourself open to persecution, uh, that you follow me at the risk of being persecuted, of uh, being you know, uh, made fun of, of, of even losing your life. You're going to pick up this cross and you're not going to live as the world lives, but you're going to live as I've called you to live. And you're going to follow me. How am I, How are you going to follow me? Well, you're going to obey me. You're going to obey my commands. You're going to do what I tell you to do. And that's the call of following Jesus. As much as we call, we, we follow Jesus into the hope of glory and eternity and all of his promises and being taken care of and being provided for and being having the counselor and being helped, we're also following him into sacrifice and servanthood, and servitude, and uh, suffering, that we're following Jesus into those arenas. And we also have this, this life that where we just are called to reflect the image of God, the image of Christ into our world. And, and so often I can get in the way of that. I can get, not, not only can I get in the way of seeing Jesus clearly because of my self-centeredness and my selfishness and my pride and sin, but man, how much more is the image of Jesus veiled and not able to be reflected into the world because of those very same reasons. So today on our Sabbath day, our, 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 our Sabbath Sunday, that's an opportunity for us to begin to think, Lord, Am I really separating from myself in following you? Am I giving up my wants for what you want? Am I giving up what the world wants from me for what you want from me? And if you didn't listen to last week's sermon, I, I really encourage you, um, strongly encourage you to listen to last week's sermon and the week before. And um, I, I just pray that you would you would uh, take some time to listen to that. Maybe Sabbath, Sunday is a good time to go back to the sermons you've missed as we've been walking through Mark and take some time to, to listen to those and to study um, his word. 
Well, in this time, it's six days later, as Mark describes. And we pick up here in Mark chapter 9, verse 2. So after this, this moment where Jesus says, you've got to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to live your life, you must lose it, right? And uh, how much, you know, Jesus says, uh, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? That is, if you live for the world, you're going to lose your soul. But if you live for me, you gain it. You, you, you gain everlasting life. Your soul is secure forever in eternity with me. Well, six days later, we're in this place where Jesus is going to have a intimate uh, moment, a, a, a very intimate moment, a very powerful moment with three of his closest disciples, these close inner circle, as they're known, these close inner circle disciples are Peter, James, and John. And Peter, James, and John are with him. And so see, see this here. Now, please take a moment. Just because Peter made the mistake in you know, falsely instructing and correcting Jesus doesn't mean that Jesus just kicked him out and kicked him to the curb and gave him that one and done. If we know Peter, he's screwing up all over the place. He's got this zeal and this impulsivity about him. He doesn't really think before he speaks, but but Jesus sees something in Peter that's just very powerful. He he sees the potential that Peter has in being, you know, his representative. Uh, his apostle, his disciple maker, even after he's gone, uh, even after Jesus, you know, resurrects and ascends to be seated at the right hand of the Father, he's, he's, we're going to be seeing Peter in his ministry turning the world upside down. So, so here we have Peter, who's very zealous, you know, he's very impulsive, um, he's very quick to act and slow to think, and. Um, Jesus still continues to care for Peter, to have Peter at his side. James and John, as we move on, they're going to have some really uh, superficial conversations. They're going to be thinking about status and who's sitting on your right and who's sitting on your left and all these things. They, they want to be in these places of status. Jesus correct them. So he's got these three knuckleheads <laughs> and he takes them up this high mountain and in the other Gospels, it's described as a place where Jesus wants to go and pray. And so he leads them up this high mountain where they are all alone. It's just the four of them. And it says, as we continue, there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, and it said, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, they looked around. They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So here's uh, just a couple of things that I would like for us to talk about on this Sabbath Sunday together. One, Jesus took Peter James and John with them and led them up to a high mountain, all right? He led them up to this high place, um, this place that is secluded from the rest of the disciples. He leaves them at the foot of the mountain and he takes them up with him uh, to, you know, up to the high mountain. And an encouragement that I have for us is if we think about where Peter was in the valley of his misunderstanding, for Jesus then to take him up to this high mountain place and to reveal himself transfigured in these dazzling white clothes. Um, the gospel writers describe him as, as like being, you know, white, like with his clothes being as white as lightning, you know, that there was this shine, that it was just, 
it, it was almost blinding. And, and Jesus is transfigured in this play, a place, wrapped in the glory of God. He's like wrapped in the in the garments of his divinity. And he reveals himself in this way. And he's in this moment and in this time, he's with Moses and Elijah on top of this mountain, having a conversation in front of Peter, James, and John, who are who are afraid. And they're like, what's going on here? They're like awestruck. They're dumbfounded. They're in wonder. They they can hardly believe their eyes. And I just want to give us an encouragement that Peter was once in the valley of disappointment and misunderstanding and rebuke. Okay. That means strong correction. He was in the valley of rebuke and the good teacher calls him up to the peak of this high mountain, right? Up to like the precipice of his glory for his glory to be revealed to Peter. So the very same Peter who was being corrected just, you know, almost a week ago and being rebuked is the same Peter that is now witnessing the glory of Jesus in the company of Elijah and Moses. These are like their heroes. This is like it's like Superman and Batman, you know, of, of righteousness is, is like on the top of the mountain and they're talking to, you know, Iron Man, you know, like it's kind of like that, ugh. but it's so much more than that because, you know, Jesus is wrapped in the glory of God, you know, and um, so there's this transfiguration, all this stuff is going on. And I just, I just want to confront something. Um, if you ever find yourself being corrected in Christ. If you ever find yourself in a place where you've been confronted and corrected in Christ, can you please just know that that, that is not meant to be like a uh, an indictment that that then is meant to keep you from the church or keep you from your faith or keep you from growing or keep you from knowing who Jesus is. And so often I think when it comes to like accountability and correction in our flesh and in our pride and in our hurt and disappointment, sometimes that can keep us from experiencing greater things that Jesus has in store for us. And, and it's kind of like we allow the enemy to use that rift and use that tension and use that hurt to keep us from, from knowing Jesus more fully, having our eyes opened, uh, open much more to who he is because we're hanging on to the correction and it's ruminating and it's work. Or if you feel like you've just been getting it wrong and, and you've been mis misunderstanding uh, this walk with Jesus, or if you've been walking in hypocrisy, can I just tell you that like Jesus is not done with you yet. And, and sometimes we can be so hard on ourselves that when we're in the valley of like sin and misunderstanding and getting it wrong and all, that there's no chance that Jesus would ever want us on the, the mountaintop of his, his revelation and uh, his, his might and his goodness and faithfulness. And I, I just want to say like this, this Sunday, this morning, maybe take some time and just confess those places where you've misunderstood, where you've been hanging on to your sin. Maybe you've been nursing some hurt and you can acknowledge, man, this is really keeping me from knowing Jesus more, from knowing Jesus better, from following him more closely, from being able to witness the miracles that Jesus wants to work in my life, to, to trust him more fully. And so can you just take a moment this morning and just reflect on that and just say, and, and, and repent of that and say, Jesus, I don't want any of this to get in the way of me knowing you better, knowing you more, experiencing your grace more fully. Lord, I, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give this to you because I know that you have so much more for me that I'm giving than I'm giving you credit for. And the only person that's really getting in the way of me experiencing more fully your faithfulness and your, you know, your presence and your instruction and your goodness and kindness 
The only one getting in the way of that is me. And so I just pray this morning, you just give yourself some time to say, just because you've messed up here doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't still want you there. He does, and he loves you. So it's a little encouragement for you. So here comes Elijah and Moses, and uh, in Matthew and Luke, they discuss, you know, how they're having a conversation. Here comes Peter, and he's He's like, I don't know what to say. I'm so scared, but I feel like I need to say something. You know, I need to prove myself you know, or that I know something or I can give something or I have some good idea. And like, you would think that Peter would wait for Jesus to instruct, you know, Peter, James, and John on what to do in this case. Um, but Peter just takes his own initiative to, to you know, uh, bring an appeal or a suggestion to what they should do now that they're in the presence of these heroes, you know, these Old Testament heroes, Moses and Elijah. I'm telling you this right now. If Jesus has on the garments of lightning, basically, shining as white, whiter than anybody could ever make clothes to be, and it's almost blinding to me and my two friends, and then I see Elijah and Moses I'm just, I feel like I'm going to wait on on what they have for me to do. I don't think I'm going to bring my own initiative or suggestion and, and recommendation for what we ought to do on this mountain. And I, and I know what Peter, I think I know what Peter wants to do. He's like, hey, these guys are here. Jesus, you're wrapped in the glory of God. Elijah's come back. Here's Moses. Let's make some dwelling places for the three of you on the top of this mountain. Like, let's keep you here. Let's set up camp, man. Maybe we build a little retreat here. People could come up and visit or you could just reign and rule from here. I mean, the peak of this mountain is as good as any place to have the three of you be and, and to have you, you know, establish, you know, the, the dominion of God, like throughout the world. And I, I'm, I'm happy to set up those <laughs> for you. And I'm sure James and John would be happy to, you know, to help set up and build some things. And it's just this, uh, he's so excited. He's so impulsive. He has these ideas and, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden we hear this loud voice, but before we get into the loud voice, I just, isn't that so like us, you know, like there's this big move of the spirit or there's something that's happening and automatically like we just want to run to setting up the program. You know, we want to set up the program. We want to set up camp. We want to, you know, we want to keep the moment. We, we do everything that we do to, or or everything that we can to just like keep the moment going. And uh, a lot of us do run to programming and and pouring gas on it. And, you know, we, we want to, we, we want to stay right here. Like this is a glorious moment. Let's stay right here. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's bad, but that's not what Jesus commanded them to do. That That's not what Jesus instructed them to do. Uh, they were taking that, Peter was taking his own initiative, thinking this might be an answer to a problem that wasn't even there. Look, Peter is going kind of the Martha route in this whole thing. Remember Martha and Mary? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was doing all this cooking and cleaning around the house, trying to get ready for dinner and the guests. And Mary's just sitting at Jesus's feet, just learning from him, you know? And uh, Martha's like, Jesus, tell her, tell her to help me. Like, what's going on? She's just sitting there at your feet and learning from you and she should be getting this house in order. Like that's her role. And Jesus is like, she's she's chosen the better thing just to be at my feet and to learn from me. Peter missed an opportunity here just to be in the presence of Jesus Christ in, in glory and in the presence of Moses and Elijah. And what does he want to do? He wants to work. He wants to work. He, he wants to build stuff. He wants to, you know, uh, build these tents. He, he wants to have this place of retreat. He, he wants to set up camp. He, he wants to work. But, but really what Peter needed to do and what a great opportunity Jesus 
had given Peter and James and John, really what they needed to do was maybe just listen, maybe just rest in that space, maybe just learn what they could from what was going on there. I mean, we have Moses, you know, Moses represents the law. Isaiah or Elijah represents the prophets. And there's Jesus who represents and is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And there's this, this beautiful moment happening where the representative of the law and the representative of the prophets comes into the presence of the fulfillment of those two things. And I'm positive there was some incredible conversation going on there. And, and, and some just glorious, there's something glorious happening there. And I believe that James, John, and Peter would have benefited from just being present, not thinking about the work, not thinking about what they could build, not thinking about how they could strive. That's what we want to do, right? We want to just work and strive and build. But in all that, they would have been missing the presence, the presence of Jesus, the presence of these heroes. He would have, they would have been missing the presence. So he wants to do all this work. And then all of a sudden, this cloud appears and covers, just consumes them. It wraps them up. And this voice came and it says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Just listen to him. Stop with all of your striving. Stop trying to impress people. Just listen to him. Listen to the Son of God. Listen to the Messiah. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus at his word. Listen to Jesus in his presence. Listen to Jesus uh, as the Son of God. Listen to Jesus. And so with that, this Sunday, I'm charging and challenging us to begin to ask the Holy Spirit for the wisdom it takes to gain an ear for the Lord's voice. To gain an ear, to have the ability to hear the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a great place to start is in his word. We've got so many beautiful words in red. And here's the thing. As we continue in Mark, the words in red are going to become a lot more prominent. He's going to start talking a lot and he's going to start speaking very plainly and very directly to his disciples. And I want us to be encouraged by the words that Jesus had for us. I mean, if we look at the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew, beginning at chapter five, like if we begin with the Sermon on the Mount and just read all of those beautiful, convicting, challenging words in red, man, what sort of work and transformative work, how would that train us even in righteousness as we choose to follow Jesus, so many countercultural statements in that sermon. The best sermon, greatest sermon ever delivered, we can read. And so spend some time in the word this morning. Take Jesus at his word. And look, guys, we must listen to our Lord. Even when we want to go our own way, even when we think we have a better idea, even when we have our own path carved out, we are called to listen to the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many of us know Jesus as our Savior, but we don't know him as our Lord. And him being our Lord means that we are willing to listen and obey. And so this, this morning, I, I just pray that you would have a time of reflection, uh, repentance, uh, that you would have a time of prayer, a time of worship, 
And you would seek out the Holy Spirit's help and saying, Jesus, help me to be a follower, a disciple that obeys your word, that doesn't just go after my own ideas and my own agenda out of my own strength because I feel like it makes sense, you know, or I feel like it's what I'm supposed to do or whatever. No, I go after your leading and you've given me an ear to hear you. You've given me eyes to see you and you've given me the courage, the heart to follow you, follow you courageously as I walk according to the convictions that you've given me. Not the excuses that I've made, but the convictions that I have in following you as the truth. Even if those decisions are hard, even if it means that I'm going to have to make sacrifices, even if it means that the plan has to be altered or changed, I will do that for the sake of following you. Why? Because you're the son of God. One, two, you just know better. So Lord, those are the three places that I pray that you would work in us. Let us not Um, Let us not believe that we aren't worthy of following you uh, to the mountaintop where you're attempting and wanting to reveal something deeper about yourself because we've been disappointed in the valley. So let us not refuse to continue to walk with you um, to higher places because we've been disappointed or gotten it wrong in the valley place. Please help us not to do that. Two, when when we're with you, let us not be preoccupied and distracted by the excuse me by the work and the agenda and all those things. Let us just be in your presence. Can we just be in your presence? Let us just sit and enjoy our Savior and the Son of God in your presence. Let us thank you and have gratitude in this space. And then number three, give us the strength and humility that it takes to listen to you and to obey you as you lead us as your disciples. I love that verse. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Help us to listen to you. So those are the three things that I'd like to challenge you with this morning. Talk these things over. If you're with somebody that you love, journal a little bit, go for a walk, you know, tee up these three points and allow them to um, to, to bring you restoration as we um, as we can, as we just worship God in this day. All right. So I love you. I'm thankful for you. And before I sign off here, I just want us to um, remember our family verse and uh, and you can you can rise for the benediction you can close your eyes you can sit whatever you'd like to do um, but this is the final benediction our family verse is found in Isaiah verse 60 chapter or, sorry Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 and it says this arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Rise City Church, I pray that you rise and shine this week as you are restored in the light and life and spirit of Christ. And I pray that you would reflect Jesus out into your week, out into your world, as you grow in him, as you uh, enjoy being present with him, and as you obey him. All right? Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful day of rest.